You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas, and here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services, your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni, host of the show called If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. I'm so glad to be here and so honored that I could bring some knowledge of our beautiful Queen Mother to make her known and loved. That is my heart's delight, to make Mary known and loved the mother of Jesus. You know, today is her birthday. According to the church, September 8th is the birthday of the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I want to offer this show as a tribute to her and in extreme gratitude to God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for giving us so good a mother, an incredible advocate. She truly is our greatest means to our ultimate end. Mary, she has nothing, there is nothing more, no greater desire, no greater love, no greater passion than to take God's children and help them to be nurtured, to be mothered, to be nourished, to be taught, to guide them to that transformation into the perfect copy image of her son Jesus. There is no greater passion by our mother. That's, that is her goal. Why? Because there's no creature that has a greater desire to satiate the thirst of her son Jesus than Mary. What is that thirst? It's a longing. Jesus, our God, longs to be united with us, the church, his bride. There's a longing. God longs for us to be united with him. And hence, we have a great longing to be united with the bridegroom. It's a marital bond, and, the, and the, the couple, the participants in this marital bond, Jesus being the bridegroom, the church that includes all of us being the bride, truly long to be united in that matrimony, in that marital bond. And our Lord will not be satisfied until that happens. And our hearts will never be satisfied until that happens. And all of humanity will not be satisfied until that happens. We will always have a longing to be united with our beloved Jesus. It's, it's that simple. It's, this is the reality. This is the theology. This is the whole message, the gospel message, why our Lord Jesus especially said, I long to eat this pash. In John chapter 6, the Last Supper, I've longed with a great longing, a great desire to eat this pash with you. Why? Because by eating the body, blood, soul, and divinity, the true presence, Christ, Jesus, truly substantially present in the Eucharist, is a consummation of that marital bond. It's a consummation of the marriage between the Lamb and his bride, so that longing can be satisfied, but, you know, St. Paul teaches us that we rise from glory to glory. There is a transformation process going on. Now, speaking of Mary, we could say that she rose from glory to glory very gracefully without any obstacles. 
perfectly, uninterrupted, and ultimately to the greatest unity, that of seeing God as he is, the beatific vision. Now, what does that mean? Now, St. Paul says, no eyes have seen, no ears have heard. What great glory God has for those who love him. We don't know. The only way we're going to know is when we experience it. But we are given that great promise and, of course, the virtue of faith, hope, and charity to attain that great promise. We all should be striving for this. St. Saint Peter teaches, this is what he teaches. In Peter, first, uh, Peter, second letter of Peter, um, chapter 1, verses 3, 3 through 7, I guess. Anyways, I'll read on, but you'll get the gist. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Wow, what does that mean? The only way we're going to find out is if we go and find out. Do not miss this opportunity. Look to the queen of heaven to help us to attain that because no one knows that perfect glory more than Mary. She is most God-like being united to God, seeing him as he is, enjoying the beatific vision, which St. Thomas Aquinas says, the direct essence, the direct experience of the divine essence. Wow. Really go, let's, let, us, uh, let us ask for that great desire, to, for, to desire that. Lord, grant us the grace through the heart of Mary in union with St. Joseph to have that great desire to be united with you so that we could see you as you truly are and be transformed into other Christs. Wow! What a promise! So St. Peter goes on to say, pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature partakers of the divine nature a partaker of the very essence of God wow I can't wait to find out. But I certainly don't want to miss out on this one. And I'm hoping that what I speak to you reaches your ears and your heart, that you will sell, like, uh, like Jesus says, go and sell that field and find that buried treasure in the field and sell everything that you own to obtain it because that is the treasure. The pearl of great price, Jesus, the beatific vision, but it is a transformation process. And no one knows that more than Mary. And no, no human person has come to the unity with God, the more perfect unity, in living out and living in perfectly the divine will of God and has been raised to such heights of great glory than the mother of God. No one has bore more fruit than the mother of God. How do I know that? It's by the fruit of her womb. Is there anyone that can claim they bore more fruit than the mother of God? Is there anyone out there? Can you think of anyone? There isn't any. She bore the fruit of her womb, the Savior, the Word become flesh. She is the most perfect holy of holies. She is the living tabernacle in virtue of having the Christ child in her womb. She is the perfect temple of God. In the Old Testament, it was an imperfect holies of holies, an imperfect temple, an imperfect tabernacle. Nevertheless, the typology in the Old Testament was, was to give us a glimpse of of what the perfect tabernacle, the womb of Mary, is to be like. That typology painted an imperfect picture or image of what the future perfection of 
the holies of holies would be like. So this is a tribute to our beautiful queen mother, and I would like to say, dear mother, my beautiful queen and mother, I can't thank you enough for all you do for me and all for all of us. I can't thank you enough for giving us Jesus. And like God the Father, not only did you bear the Son of God, where the immaterial God became material in this world, the Word became flesh, but our eyes could, now, could not see in the, in the realm of the immaterial, can now see him in the flesh, in the material. But we could see with our senses. You brought him into this earth. And you bore him, and you raised him, you nurtured him, you taught him, you guided him, and you gave him up on the cross like God the Father, out of pure love for God and love for all of your children. You knew this had to be. I can't thank you enough, dear mother, and I want to say happy birthday. And happy birthday to you, Mary, my beautiful queen and mother. And I will offer this show as a tribute to you in thanksgiving to God and hoping that those who will listen will be inspired to take you as their mother because Jesus gave you, all of humanity, gave us you. A woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. And we know that John is the beloved, beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. We're all called to be beloved disciples. And he represents all the beloved disciples. And I'm hoping that more and more will take you into their own home, like John, so that you can mother them into another Jesus and bring them to that perfect vision of God but we will be united to him intimately, fused with the divine nature of God and partake of his glory. Wow. So we look to you, dear mother. I give myself entirely to you, and I hope all those listening will respond in the same manner. Amen. The first thing I want to do is take us to the Office of Readings, or the Divine Office, or the Liturgy of the Hours. And, you know, the liturgy is really what the Church has given us through the years as a means, as a way and a guide and a form of prayer that will help us to attain our ultimate end. Prayer is so necessary to have an intimate relationship with our God. Without it, there is no salvation. We must become men and women of prayer. We must. We must be in that communication with God. And the liturgy of the hours is one of the most powerful ways to form that prayer life and to have an intimate relationship grow from glory to glory, if you will, with our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, with our God. Why? It's Scripture. It's the very Word of God. It contains all the Psalms. It contains many writings of great saints, like St. Leo the Great. And I'm going to use one of his writings to, to kind of describe what, the fruit that Our Lady bears and the great glory that she gives to God. I'm going to use um, his writing, and that is found in the, the Office of Readings, the Liturgy of the Hours. I'm also going to use a writing found in the Liturgy of the Hours from St. Alared, an abbot who was uh, around the time, of the, he lived around the time of the 1100s. It is absolutely stunning what he has to say about Our Lady. And also from the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church of the Second Vatical Council, found in Lumen Gentium, um, numbers 61 through 62. So it is taken straight from the, uh, the Dogmatic Constitution of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, and it is stunning what it has to say. And I'm hoping that this will paint a picture um, so that we can understand 
the meaning of how God is glorified in how much fruit we bear. And of course, Jesus talks about that, how his Father is glorified when we bear fruit. And, you know, why do I do that right now? Let's go to uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, where Jesus is a true vine. And I'll read from there, and I'll stop when I see it appropriate, probably to verse 12. But anyways, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. All right, so the key line there is he it is that bears much fruit, but we must abide in him. And I'm, let me jump ahead a little bit to John chapter, or jump behind a little bit to John chapter 6, where he says, he who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, I abide in him and he in me. What's he talking about there? The necessity of receiving him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. The Eucharist at the Mass on every altar in every church said throughout the world, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, around the world, the Eucharistic celebration, which also is uh, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, whereby without any sacrifice, without the passion, there would be no mercy and no forgiveness of sins. So it's both and. But nevertheless, it is the, the feast, the, the Eucharistic meal is really the consummation of the marriage between the Lamb of God and his bride, or the bridegroom Jesus and his bride, the church. Very essential. I abide in you and you in me. And it's really in the Eucharist that you cannot get a more intimate union a more abiding presence of Christ than in the very core of our being by taking him internally, which we are both body and spirit. So we consume Christ substantially present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, both his material reality, his, his immaterial person, and his material person. So Jesus the divine and Jesus the God-man. So our Lord goes on to say in John chapter 15, He who abides in me, I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Now, of course, his words also taken from John chapter 6 is, He who eats of the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, I abide in him and he in me. Those are his words, not the Catholic Church's words. Those are the words of our Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 6, it's not something symbolic or something he's willing to compromise on. In fact, when the Pharisees that who doubted said, this, Who could hear this saying? Our Lord doubled down. He didn't say, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just talking symbolically here. Don't, please don't leave. He didn't do that. He doubled down. And he went on to say, my flesh is real, drink, bl uh, real meat and my blood is real drink. He who eats of my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise him on the last day. I abide in him and he in me. He's showing us the necessity of receiving him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Now our Lord Lady, she contained the Eucharistic presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in her womb. In her womb. The fullness of his presence in the womb of Mary. So getting back to John chapter 6, by, our Lord says, if you abide in me and my words and, and I in you, Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove 
to be my disciples. Wow. Now, what comes to mind is the fruit of Mary's womb. No human creature, no angel, no human creature has bore more fruit than the mother of God. Now, what does that mean? My father is glorified. By this, my father is glorified. He is glorified even more when he prunes and we bear more fruit. No one glorifies the Father more than Mary. Now, let's, speak, let's talk about that a minute. Let's take a look at Let's go back to the Old Testament, Moses. What happened when he went up and met God face to face? This is kind of like typology of the beatific vision, our promised glory in heaven. To see God face to face, Moses didn't, didn't see him face to face, but he spoke to him face to face. Oh, my goodness. Think about that. And what happened when he came down from the mountain? He had a veil, his face, because the glory of God shone through Moses. Think about that. That is an imperfect kind of typological foretaste of what is the, the, the kind of glory that is waiting for us in eternity. Moses' glory was imperfect because eventually it faded in this temporal world. It faded, but not in eternity. But it's a foreshadowing of what is to come. Does that mean it goes away when we enter heaven? Of course not. That would be absurd. God is giving us a foreshadowing of the future glory, just like the transfiguration, and guess who was there at the transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. God the Father was there saying, look, this is what's waiting for you. Listen to my son, he'll get you there. And our, our Lord, our blessed Lord says, take my mother into your own home so that she can help you. It's right there at the foot of the cross. No one bore more fruit and glorifies God more than Mary. Can you imagine the glory of God that shines through Mary? God is glorified in Mary. In fact, there is a statement by St. Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, and he says it very simply. The glory of God is the human person fully alive in the life of man. God is the glory of God is the human person fully alive, fully alive. And the vision of God is the glory of God is is man fully perfected. But anyways, he says the glory of God is having man fully alive. So when, when we are perfected, especially when we see God face to face in the beatific vision, is God most glorified because we are fulfilling perfectly the role that he has destined for us, that he has designed for us, so that God could work fully as he did in Jesus. God the Father worked fully without any obstacles, just full freedom, kind of like the action that I have where I don't even have to think about moving my hand by pushing a pen. It's just such a free, harmonious relationship between my, my brain and my hand, if you will. But that's really what it is to be united with God, as his being, him, him being the Godhead. But why am I saying this? Because if we minimize Mary... And if Mary is the one where we could see God's glory shining through most, and let me just kind of paint a small analogy or a comparison. The saints are to shine like the stars because they bear testimony to the Son of God and they teach the commandments and they live commandments. That's what Scripture teaches us. They will shine. Anyone who teaches these commandments will shine like the stars. Well, Our Lady shines like the sun with the glory of God. Big difference. Can we minimize the light the sun, the sun emits? Or can we put the sun in a, in a closet 
and expect the glory of God to shine? Or do we hide from the sun by um, putting a, an umbrella to, to block it? Of course we wouldn't do that. No more can we put stuff Mary in a closet or minimize the role of Mary that was given by God because when we do that, we're minimizing God's glory. And nothing else makes sense. Any other um, explanation doesn't make sense. So if, if Mary is glorifying God most, we want her to shine like the sun and embrace the great gift that God has given us because he's showing us in his glory in his creature, especially the creature of the one who bears the most fruit. I can't say that I don't want her for a mother. I can't say that. That is to block the glory of God or to reject the glory of God. Can, I, can you, anyone imagine saying to Moses, oh, you know what, I don't accept your teaching and, you know, I don't really need you, Moses. Um, you know what, I, I kind of want to put Moses in a box and, and do it my way. Do you see the absurdity of this? How much more the mother of God? So what I'd like to do at this point, you know, and these are words of great saints that are pointing to this reality, and I'm just trying to emphasize it and bring it about and put, you know, put away errors that somehow if we are exaggerated in our devotion to Mary, we rob God of glory. It's not true. Because she is the creature whom God has highly exalted based on her profound humility and her cooperation with the will of God so that she could rise from glory to glory beyond our imagining above all the holy angels and saints put together because she never deviated from the will of God. She lived it out perfectly with perfect faith, hope, and charity, who are we to judge? How can we judge that Mary, if I over, am over-devoted to her and embrace her as my mother and pray to her and ask her for inter her intercession to, to help me become transformed by her motherly nurturing into another Christ, how could I say that I'm robbing glory from God? On the contrary, when we embrace Mary and she brings us to that perfection that God desires for us, that's where God receives the most glory. Because she cooperates with God the Father who prunes us and we bear more fruit because she is our mother and she cares nothing more than meticulously taking care of her children so she could help us to bear the most fruit so that we could glorify her son the most. So it's a fallacious argument to say that if I pray to Mary too much and I'm over-devoted to her, it's fallacious to say that I rob her son of glory. It just doesn't make sense. Now, we don't worship her. Worship is God, due to God alone. We honor, we venerate, we respect, but I will say this. If we could outdo Jesus in devotion to his mother, then we just outdone Jesus. It's impossible. And if we can outdo Mary in devotion to her son, then we need to say, Mary, step aside. I don't need you. We need her. She will teach us the way to be truly devoted to her son because no one has more devotion to her son Jesus than Mary. No one. We cannot possibly outrun her in devotion to Christ. She's going to teach us. She's a great gift from God. An incredible gift that we must strive or at least pray for the grace to embrace with our whole heart. It's for our own good. In this way, Our Lady helps to satiate the thirst of her son, that thirst 
of being united with his bride. We are his bride. The sooner that we can get there, the sooner the the thirst of Jesus will be satisfied. And we know by great saints like St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. John Paul II, St. Mother Chisa, St. John Eudes, St. Anthony Mary Claret, St. Dominic. We know by these saints that the fastest, the quickest, the easiest way to sanctification in the most powerful way is through consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which means that I give everything to her. But isn't that what Jesus is calling for? When he says, woman, behold your son, John, behold your mother. And scripture goes on to say, and from that hour, John, the disciple, took Mary into his own home. Teach me, Mary. I'm taking you into my own home. In fact, the original Greek, I believe, but don't quote me on this. I heard this from a very Marian priest, and who knows uh, his Greek or his Hebrew way better than me, but he said the actual translation means heart. It's not even home. It means heart. So I believe that, and I accept that. I I embrace that um, teaching on the word home. So I'm going to go on and read on. Um, Let me go to the writing by St. Leo the Great, who is a pope, uh, one of the great popes of our church, and is found in the Office of Readings. He says, the Lord then goes on to say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This hunger is not for any bodily food. This thirst is not for any earthly drink. It is a longing to be blessed with righteousness, and by penetrating the secret of all mysteries, to be filled with the Lord himself. That is our ultimate end. And I have to say, no other creature, not even angels, no human creature has been filled more with Christ himself than Mary. Hence the words, hail, full of grace. Meditate on that. Ask God, what does that mean? Mary, help me to discover what that means and help me to attain as much of that being full of grace like you as I can. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. No creature has borne more fruit than Mary. No creature, therefore, no creature has glorified God more than Mary. Happy is the soul that longs for the food of righteousness and thirsts for this kind of drink. It would not seek such things if it had not already savored their delight. When the soul hears the voice of the Spirit saying to it, through the prophet, Taste and see that the Lord is good. It has already received a portion of God's goodness and is on fire with love, the love that gives joy of the utmost purity. It counts nothing, all that belongs to time. It is entirely consumed with desire to eat and drink the food of righteousness. The soul lays hold of the true meaning of the first and great commandment, you shall love the Lord God with your whole heart your whole mind, and your whole strength. For to love God is nothing else than to love righteousness. Finally, just as concern for one's neighbor is added to love of God, so the virtue of mercy is added to the desire for righteousness. As it is said, blessed are the merciful, for God will be merciful to them. And I will add here in just a minute, the great saint, St. John Vianney, says, in the heart of Jesus is both justice and mercy, infinite justice, but infinite mercy. But in the heart of Mary, who imitates Christ most, there is only mercy. Only mercy. So St. Leo goes on to say, Remember, Christian, the surpassing worth of the wisdom that is yours. Bear in mind the kind of school in which you are to learn your skills, the rewards to which you are called. Mercy itself wishes you to be merciful, righteous. Itself wishes you to be righteous. So that the Creator may shine forth in His creature. 
and the image of God be reflected in the mirror of the human heart as it imitates his qualities. All right? So there you go. So that the Creator may shine forth in his creature, in this my Father is glorified. The more the creature shines, the more the glory of God is in that creature. How can I say that too much love of Mary takes away glory from God? It's on the contrary. He wants us to love his mother. In this way, he is glorified because we are loving the creature through whom he is glorified most. It's almost like saying an artist is glorified in his artwork, but if everybody looks at an art and says, ah, you know, I don't need that, I go straight to the artist, you know, ah, you know what, I'm not, really, I'm not really into his art. Well, what takes glory from the artist more, rejecting the art? Or embracing it and saying, wow, thank you. I'm going to use this to meditate on the, and, and look into the, your, the glory of you that's shining through this. I see the very depths of your being being expressed in the, your art, Mr. Artist. Well, the same thing with God. We see the very beauty of God being expressed in his, in his fullness, in the beauty of his creature Mary. No other creature shines with the, the beauty and glory of God more than Mary. We must embrace this great truth and this great gift from God. And this way, when we console the heart of Mary, we console the heart of Jesus. So I'm going to read on from uh, St. Leo. He says, the faith of those who live their faith is a serene faith. What you long for will be given you. What you love will be yours forever. Since it is by giving alms that everything is pure for you, you will also receive that blessing which is promised next by the Lord. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. That is one virtue that our, the great mother of God Anywhere you look at all of the writings from the saints and every word that she may speak in authentic apparitions or whatever, like Fatima or um, like, uh, like Lourdes, she's always asking for the, to pray for the virtue of purity. Why? So we can see God purely. After all, we must be purified to see God as he is, the beatific vision. Otherwise, that ultimate transformation cannot take place. That ultimate fusing with the divine nature of God cannot take place. And Mary helps us to do this because she is the most pure creature, and no one knows it better than her. And, who, and having said that, who could teach us greater than she? Dear friends, great is the happiness of those whom such a reward is prepared, who are the clean of heart if not those who strive for those virtues we have mentioned above? What mind can conceive what words can express the great happiness of seeing God? Yet human nature will achieve this when it has been transformed so that it sees the Godhead no longer in a mirror or obscurely but face to face, the Godhead that no man has been able to see, in the inexpressible joy of this eternal vision, human nature will possess what eye has not seen or heard, what man's heart has never conceived. When we see, you now these are my own words that I put little notes. When we see God face to face, we are transformed into the Lord. That's what it means to be partakers of divine nature. Jesus became man. And the, and the church fathers have said, so that we can become like God. What an incredible gift from our Lord. And it's, it would be, I believe, a, a healthy, holy way to attaining that when we embrace the great gift of Mary and take her into our own home so that she could teach us which all, everything her son taught. Can you imagine what he inspired in her being while being in her womb alone? We can't even imagine what kind of union and the kind of grace and light that our Lord would have brought to the great mother of God. 
She wants to share that with us. All right, and now, now I would like to take our focus to what St. Alared the Abbot said about our, our mother as a tribute and as a birthday present to our beautiful Queen Mother. He says, now of course this is taken from the Divine Office, the Office of Readings, and it's from the comment of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay? And he says, let us come to, this, to his bride, his mother, his perfect handmaid for the Blessed Mary is all of this. But what are we to do for her? What kind of gifts shall we offer her? Would that we could at least return what we are in duty bound to do, for we owe her honor and service. We owe her love and praise. We owe her honor, for she is the mother of our Lord. He who fails to honor the motherly, the mother clearly dishonors the son. This is coming from St. Alderet, a saint. He says, he who fails to honor the mother clearly dishonors the son. Also, Scripture says, honor your father and your mother. What then, my brother, shall we say? Is she not our mother? How could we call Jesus our brother? These are my words. But how could we call Jesus our brother if we say Mary is not my mother? Is she not the mother of God? Is Jesus not God? Is Jesus not my brother then? He, she must be my mother if she is Jesus' mother and Jesus is my brother. When then, my brother, shall we say, is she not our mother? Yes, my brother, she is indeed our mother, for through her we have been born, not for the world, but for God. Once we all lay in death, as you know and believe in sin, in darkness, in misery, in death because we had lost the Lord, in sin because of our corruption, in darkness for we were without the light of wisdom, and thus had perished utterly, but then we were born, far better than through Eve, through Mary the Blessed, because Christ was born of her. We have recovered new life in place of sin, immortality instead of mortality, light in place of darkness. She is our mother, the mother of our life, the mother of our incarnation, the mother of our light. As the Apostle says of our Lord, he became for us by God's power our wisdom and justice and holiness and redemption. She then, as mother of Christ, is the mother of our wisdom and justice, of our holiness and redemption. She is more our mother than the mother of our flesh. Our birth from her is better, for from her is born our holiness, our wisdom, our justice, our sanctification, our redemption. Praise the Lord in his holy ones, say the scriptures. If our Lord is to be praised in those holy ones through whom he brings to being deeds of power and miracles, how much more is he to be praised in her, in whom he fashioned himself, who is wonderful beyond all wonders. Happy are you, Holy Virgin Mary, and most worthy of all praise. For from your womb, Christ, the Son of Justice, has risen. Very powerful words, inspiring words from St. Alared the Abbot. He lived in the 1100s. Look him up. Um, look up St. Leo the Great, the great pope, and uh, learn a little bit about his lives and about these saints' lives and when they lived. And finally tonight... Um, I want to finish with from the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church of the Second Vatican Council, taken from Lumen Gentium, number 61 through 62. You can find it also in the uh, Common of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Office of Readings. And it talks about Mary's motherhood in the order of grace. The Blessed Virgin was predestined to be the mother of God in the eternal plan for the incarnation of God's word. By decree of God's providence, she was, here on earth, the loving mother of the divine Redeemer, the noblest of all his companions, and the humble servant of the Lord, in conceiving Christ, in bearing him, in nursing him, in presenting him to the Father in the temple, 
in sharing her son's passion as he was dying on the cross by her obedience, her faith, her hope, a burning love, she cooperated in a way that was quite unique in the work of the Savior in restoring supernatural life to souls. She is therefore a mother to us in the order of grace. The motherhood of Mary in the order of grace from the consent which she gave in faith at the Annunciation and which she continued to give unhesitatingly at the foot of the cross lasts without interruption until all the elect enter into the eternal fulfillment. So I'm just going to pause here for a moment on that line. Last without interruption until all the elect enter into eternal fulfillment. Because Jesus' thirst on the cross is anticipating that. He will always thirst for the last, until the last soul is united to him in eternal glory. Our Blessed Mother helps souls to attain that. That's why he looks to our mother kind of like a lure. We are lured by the beauty of God that is found in her, the grace of God in his fullness, the Holy Spirit that is found in her, the sweetness of his glance and his mercy. His motherly maternal tenderness is found in Mary. In this, God the Father is glorified because he's able to express his deep, intimate, tender, merciful motherly love in the mother of God. How else do we want God to express his motherly maternal love? Do we want him to express it apart from Mary? Then why would he create her in the first place? Are we not all creatures created in his image for the purpose of bringing God great glory? How can God be glorified apart from his creatures? No more can a violinist be glorified apart from his violin than a creature than God be glorified apart from his creatures. Of course, he's glorified in himself, but it, the scripture teaches he thirsts for a relationship with his children, and he wants to live and act in them in his fullness so that he can be glorified. In other words, so that he could be loved back. And we can act like him and perform the role and, and act in the very roles that he has given us. We don't want to inhibit the role that God has been given, to, given Mary. Why would we want to do that? So moving on. When she was taken up into heaven, she did not lay aside the saving role. But she continues by her intercession for all to gain for us the gifts of eternal salvation. So Mary's role and her action within her role and all that God created her to do did not end after she died. In fact, it is perfected now. And she acts more fully now than she ever has even on earth. Even being a full participator in the divine nature while on earth in virtue of her immaculate conception. Of course, she didn't enjoy the beatific vision. She certainly was full of grace. What does that mean? The angel said, Hail, full of grace. Blessed are you among women, highly favored daughter of God. Elizabeth said, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For the moment that your voice sounded in my ears, the babe leapt for joy. The first tabernacle. And like David... John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth danced before the holies of holies. In her maternal love, she cares, uh, getting back to Lumen Gentium, in her maternal love, she cares for the brothers and sisters of her son. There you have it. As they journey on earth in the midst of dangers and hardships until they are brought safely home to the happiness of heaven, why would Mary not want that? That is her main drive. Jesus gave all of humanity to his mother for her to be her children. She has the love of God in her heart. She must love with the love, very love of God so that she could be mother of all of God's children. Jesus being the firstborn. The Blessed Virgin is thus invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, auxiliatrix, 
Adriatrix, and Mediatrix. These titles must not, however, be understood as in any way detracting from or adding to the dignity and effectiveness of Christ, the one mediator. No creature can ever be classified as an equal with the incarnate word, the Redeemer, but just as the priesthood of Christ is shared in various ways by his ministry and his faithful people, and as the goodness of God, one thought it is, it is, is in different ways really shared with creatures, so also the unique mediation of Christ does not exclude but belongs about a variety of shared cooperation deriving from the one unique source. You know, after all, when you read uh, the second, the uh, Saint Peter two, Saint, Saint Peter two, the second, second Peter, he says we are to be partakers of the divine nature. That's not saying we are the divine nature or we are we to become the divine nature. We are partakers or participants. We are sharing in God's divine nature. This is exactly what this is saying here in Lumen Gentium about Mary being. Um, a partake, partaking and participating in the one mediation of Christ as mediatrix. That's what it's saying, and it's clear. It's written clearly here. She is not the one mediator. That's absurd. But she participates most fully, more fully than all the angels and saints put together. Mary participates in a very unique way. But she's calling us, and so is our Lord calling us to participate in that mediation of salvation and redemption so that we can go out and get, that's, that's the mission of the church, to go out and evangelize and give what we have received, hoping that others will receive that gift and come, become partakers of the church and partakers of all of God's great goodness and grace so that we can use it, the church, as the means to attain our ultimate end. So Lumen Gentium, uh, continuing, going on, goes on to say, the church does not hesitate to acknowledge its kind of subordinate role in the person of Mary. The church has continuous experience of its effects and commends it to the hearts of the faithful, so that as they learn on her motherly protection, as they lean on her motherly protection, they may be brought into closer union with the mediator, our Savior. That says it all. Mary, there is no other way, says great saints like Saint Louis de Montfort, Saint Maximilian Kolbe, no other great, greater way to be in the closest union with the one mediator, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, other than sincerely taking Marian consecration to heart. In a, and where it's found in Scripture is right there when John took Mary into his own home and what she must have taught him. Yes, he cared for the mother of God, but I can guarantee you she took well more care and more meticulous care of her, of him, the beloved disciple, than he of her. So I will end it there, and I thank all of you for joining me and listening. I hope this inspires you. Um, I hope you take it to heart. I will be praying for you. Please pray for me. And wish our beautiful Queen Mother a happy birthday. He'll put a smile on her where all of heaven will light up. All of heaven will rejoice with Mary because she brings the most joy to all the, all the, heavenly, um, the heavenly saints and angels, the, the heavenly uh, pilgrims. No, what's the word? I can't even, and forgive me, I can't think of the word. But the heavenly residents, thank you very much. The residents of heaven. So we thank you for joining us, and I would ask God the Father to bless all of you in the most abundant way, in the holy name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, especially through the heart of Mary in union with St. Joseph. God bless you all. Amen. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.